Thank you very much. So this is quite a broad overview of a talk. It's not so specifically about my own work, um, but it's more sort of ideas in message passing concurrency, a little bit about how they're used currently in Python, about how they might be used in the future, because of course there are some great opportunities with uh, Python 3. So why multi-core? The reason for worrying about all of this uh, concurrency stuff quite so much is largely to do with the rise of multi-core. Probably most of you have phones in your pockets that, are, that have quad-core processors. And I'm sure I don't need to tell you about what Moore's law is. That trend is going to continue. And speed-ups in programs um, will start to... Uh, be gained by using more cores more efficiently rather than simply uh, buying a faster processor. That's really important. What's also important is as hardware becomes cheaper and people do more interesting things with it, different sorts of platforms are becoming available. So this board that you can see on the slide is called the Parallela board, and it's by a company called Adaptiva. So this was a Kickstarter project, and I'm afraid I haven't brought one uh, with me, but this board is about the size of a credit card. So it's the same sort of form factor as a Raspberry Pi. And the aim of this company is to do for supercomputing what the Raspberry Pi is doing for sort of general development. So to make it cheaper, to make it more readily available on the desktop to all sorts of people, whether they be hobbyists or scientists or whatever. So the interesting thing about this board is that it's, it's kind of like the Raspberry Pi. It's got the sort of features you'd expect of a, of a single board computer. This is a dual core ARM SYNCS chip. But the really interesting thing is this chip that Adaptiva made themselves, which is a 16-core, many-core coprocessor. And the idea is, if you want to speed up your programs, then you use this coprocessor to help you do that. So they've got a 16-core version of that chip and a 64-core ver version of that chip. So that makes uh, multiprocessing very cheap, very fast and also very low energy. And that's really nice. But how would you program this board? So the default libraries are all in C. And if you want to be experimenting with a large amount of data or experimenting with making a difficult, complex scientific analysis a lot faster, probably going through the C workflow of writing very carefully crafted code that doesn't blow up as soon as you run it and compiling it and all those other things is, is not really much fun. People who use this sort of thing often want to explore and explore their data and explore their programs. And that's where dynamic languages really come in. So to use Python on a board like that would be really fantastic. But can we do it? Can we do it natively and really nicely? We don't know yet. So message passing concurrency is not a new idea. It's a very, very old idea. And it came from two lines of work. One line of work was very practical. There's this old uh, chip called the InMOS transputer. And the idea was that you would have many of these transputers. They're sort of like a CPU. And you would put them in a grid, and you would wire them all together. So this was like a sort of very early form of uh, multi-core. The other line of work was very theoretical. So CSP, communicating sequential processes, are one way of mathematically formalizing concurrent and parallel processing. There are many other ways, and they're all sort of reasonably similar in terms of the ideas that are in them. And these two things went together, but they never became popular because we had threads instead. So I'm not going to go through all of the sort of mathematical details of CSP, but I want to give you a flavor of what it's all about and why it might be important. So in the process algebra view of the world, computation has, is made up of imperative commands that run sequentially, and you have lots of those, but you have them in processes which run concurrently. 
and can communicate with each other. So you have different processes which are all running their, same their own imperative programs and they don't share any variables or any data. If they want to communicate with each other or synchronize with each other, they need a special way of doing that. And a common way of doing it, but not the only way, is to pass messages via channels. So the way to think of this as a sort of broad overview is to think about Unix processes communicating by pipes. So you have different processes all running in parallel, and if they want to communicate, they do so by pipes because they don't share any memory with each other. But I'm sort of eliding a few details there because CSP is an abstract idea. It's a mathematical formalism. So when I talk about a CSP process, that's not necessarily an operating system process. And when CSP talks about events and synchronization, that's not necessarily like the sort of events that you would see when you were programming a GUI. But it might be. It might be. And I'm going to talk about that in a bit more uh, detail later on. So why would anyone care about all of this stuff? Well, if you've worked with threads and you've worked with locks, you know they're really tough to get right. Correctness is important, and when you're dealing with really low-level things like locks and pointer arithmetic and all of this sort of stuff, it's hard, and locking is hard, and deadlocks and starvation and race hazards and all those things are hard. And they don't sit well with our sort of very high-level Pythonic view of the world, which is to use the abstractions of the language to make our life really simple and hide a lot of the really hard things, which is a good way to do computing. It's what computer science is all about. So the good thing about message passing concurrency is that message passing removes some of these possible faults that you can have with locking. So you can't have race hazards with message passing concurrency, but you could have deadlock still. So, you know, it's not perfect. And hopefully, if you have a good message passing language or library, then a lot of the difficult stuff uh, is hidden away for you in the runtime system, perhaps, or in a library. So all the cool kids are doing message passing at the moment. It's an idea that's come back around because of multi-core and other things. So these are the next few slides are some examples of message passing concurrency in different languages. So I've already mentioned Unix and pipes, and that's a sort of really simple uh, idea of message passing, and hopefully one most people are familiar with. So this is a simple sort of hello world in Go, and the syntax here is a little, uh, maybe a little unfamiliar to Python people. The idea is that here on this line, uh, we're creating a channel. So we're creating a new channel that we can pass messages around with, like our, our pipe, and that'll be bidirectional, like, uh, like a pipe is on the command line. This thing that looks like a function is a function, but this special, this special keyword go in front of it means that it's also a go routine. So a go routine is like a coroutine. It's a sort of lightweight kind of thread. It's not a thread that's created by the operating system, so it's much cheaper to create a go routine or destroy a go routine uh, than an operating system thread. And then what we're doing on this line with this sort of funny syntax is we're sending the string hello world down this channel, my channel. And then we're going to run this Go routine straight away. So it's going to be running in the background of our, of our um, program. So these sorts of funny bits of syntax, I'm afraid, really pervade this, these, uh, these ideas in languages. And you'll see a lot of weird syntax. The CSP syntax for doing this sort of thing is a pling, an exclamation mark, or to receive something down a channel, a question mark. So it, it kind of hasn't got better through the ages, in my view, <laughs> I'm afraid. So on this line here, what we're doing is we're receiving something down this channel, from this channel, and whatever we receive, we're just printing out. So this is a simple sort of hello world in that language. Rust is another new language does similar things. So we've got the same sort of th idea here. We've got a channel being created here. We've got a background process running here where we're doing some sending. Then we're receiving this uh, value and printing it out. What's slightly different with Rust is that if you 
are familiar with working with pipe, Unix pipes in C, you'll know that when you create a Unix pipe in C, what the operating system gives you is two ends of the pipe, a sending end and a receiving end. And that's what's happening here with Rust. We've got a sending end of this channel and we've got a receiving end of this channel. And the idea there is to prevent you from doing silly things like sending down the receiving end or receiving down the sending end. So you, the programmer, in Rust have to decide ahead of time what, where in my program am I going to want to send down this channel and where am I going to want to receive down this channel. It's something you need to think about um, at compile time. So Scala, being a JVM language, is taking up the whole screen with its verbose <laughs> braces. <laughs> so, uh, but this is exactly the same sort of thing. So we have an actor which is similar to the sort of background processes that we were talking about and coroutines and so on. And uh, we've got this slightly backwards here. So here we're sending. So this is really using CSP syntax with the pling. And in here we're receiving something and printing it out. And Python CSP. So Python CSP is my own library. And uh, some of you in this room have been uh, really generous and contributing to it, particularly Stefan over there. Uh, in previous Euro Pythons. So this is an attempt at doing something like this in a Pythonic way for Python, but built as an add-on to the language, as a, lang as, a, as a library. So here we've got two CSP processes. So we're not saying in the code here how those processes are sort of uh, reified, whether they're coroutines or threads or operating system processes. But we've got two processes here that can run in parallel with the decorators. We've got channels that can be shared between them and we can read and write with those channels. And again, we're just sending Hello World, printing it out. And then on this line, so this is a much more sort of CSP-ish way of doing things than perhaps the other, the other examples. We're saying, well, we're going to take these two processes and run them in parallel and start them off. And if we had a huge program with many processes, we might decide, well, we'll run them all in parallel, or we might run a few, then run a few more in sequence, whatever we, whatever we wish. So we've got quite a lot of flexibility there about how our program <laughs> is uh, sort of put together. So this last example is uh, by a student of mine, Sam Giles, and what he was looking at uh, was really interesting, which was, can we build a language like this that has the sort of Go or Rust style uh, channels and concurrencies on the R Python tool chain? So can we use the, the um, technology that the PyPy team have developed to do this? So this is exactly the same Hello World example there. We've got channels here. We're going to send down that channel a Hello World. And then we've got some sort of uh, unusual receive uh, syntax there to receive something from the channel and print it out. And this function here is being run in the background as a sort of asynchronous coroutine. So that's a really nice project and it's a really nice way of working. And I think um, obviously Sam was a, a very, very good student, but I think it's a testament to the the uh, good engineering of the PyPy team that an undergraduate student can produce a working language like that in the small amount of time for a, for a final year project. So I'm not going to talk in great detail about optimization and speed and efficiency and those sorts of, uh, those sorts of issues, but I just wanted to show you quickly uh, one of Sam's benchmarks, which shows quite nicely that with a JIT, uh, with a tracing JIT, Nowline can perform well compared to other, other languages of this sort. So Go here and Occam Pi, which is a sort of descendant of Occam, both compiled languages, and Nowline compares pretty, pretty reasonably well to them. Um, this is only a small benchmark, so we perhaps shouldn't take it as, as gospel, but it's a good indication that <coughs> this sort of way of working might, might be positive. On the other hand, um, I haven't got for you here the same benchmark with Python CSP, but we looked at similar things with Python CSP, and that was engineered very differently. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about the 
uh, the sort of design decisions that message passing concurrency implementers might take in the next sort of section of the talk. But what we found with Python CSP is that our implementations of channels were very, very slow. Very, very slow. So you wouldn't expect, or I wouldn't expect, a Python implementation of this to be as fast as something like Go or OCumPy that's compiled and has a lot of, uh, uh, so a lot of engineering going into these features. But I perhaps wouldn't expect, or I would hope that message passing would not be the bottleneck in any program. And what we actually found was that OCampi is, is incredibly fast, it's designed exactly for this, but compared to other sorts of interpreted languages, we looked at JCSP uh, for the JVM, thinking maybe, you know, because uh, JCSP is built on Java threads, Java threads are okay, but you know, they're operating system threads. Maybe we could get something like that performance. And we actually got sort of 100 or so times worse and, uh, and didn't, didn't do very well at all. So there are some lessons learned there. And that, there's some interesting stories, but part of the takeaway of this is that actually it, it's very difficult to engineer that kind of, uh, that kind of performance if you're starting from uh, an interpreted language that hasn't been built with this sort of concurrency in mind. So this next section of the talk is, is all about the sorts of varieties of message passing concurrency uh, that can be, can be created and the different decisions that an implementer would have to make uh, if they were going to implement something like this in Python. So one choice is synchronous channels versus asynchronous channels. So in the CSP way of thinking and in the sort of process algebra way of thinking and that sort of very mathematical uh, formalism, the idea is that all channels block on reading and writing. And you don't move forward with the computation until your read or your write is finished. And some people, including me, think that the nice thing about this is it's then very easy to understand what your program's doing and reason about it. Because you know exactly in what order everything's going to happen. You know, this, this piece of code will not move forward till it's finished this read, and then it'll do this, and then all the other things that are waiting on it will be able to move forward as well. Asynchronous channels, though, are quite common as well in different languages, and some people uh, suggest that they're a bit faster, and sometimes that seems to be true. And certainly the benchmark I showed you before uh, showed that in that particular benchmark, uh, Sam's asynchronous channels for Nowlang uh, were a little bit faster than his synchronous ones. If you do have synchronous channels, though, you need to think a little bit about avoiding some of the common problems that people have with concurrency, like starvation, and uh, you don't necessarily want a process to block for a very long time if it doesn't have to. Sometimes it might have to, sometimes it might be waiting on a long computation, but if you don't have to block, you would probably prefer not to. So a common feature of message passing uh, languages and libraries is some way of selecting the next ready uh, event to process. So if we're thinking in terms of events being channels and message passing down channels, if you have a lot of channels that you're waiting on and you want to read from, so for example, if you've got a sort of map reduce type problem or a worker farmer type problem, then you might say, well, give me the one that's ready first. And that's called alternating in sort of uh, OCAM, old fashioned uh, language or selection uh, more generally. So you can say, select for me the channel that's ready to read. Um, and usually if you're implementing that selection, you do that rather carefully, because although you might want to select the next most, uh, the next ready channel to read from, if you've got a channel that's always ready to read from, and some that are, that are taking a little while, you don't want those other channels to not be processed. So, Usually there's a little bit of uh, work goes into that to avoid starvation and uh, do some good load balancing. So that's one issue, synchronous or asynchronous channels, or you might say buffered or unbuffered channels. Another issue is, are your channels bidirectional or are they unidirectional? So we saw in Rust, 
In Rust, you get uh, what you get in, in Unix C, which is a read end and a write end of a channel. And that's quite a, a common way of um, working with channels to avoid, uh, miss, uh, uh, avoid some mistakes in your, in your code. If you look at the JCSP library, which is a very nice library because it's been engineered very well with a lot of thought going into its correctness. The JCSP library is very Java-like and Java people don't mind having thousands of classes to choose from and large amounts of documentation and they don't mind pressing control space in their ID and getting a long, long, long list of things. And so JCSP sort of works with that, that paradigm and it has lots of different channel types that are all classes. I haven't listed them all because the slides are small. Um, but so you can have things like you can have a one-to-one -one channel that has one reader and one writer process attached to it at any one time. You can have an any-to-any -any channel that has any number attached to them at any time and so on. And then you always have the read end and the write end of that, ch that uh, channel wherever you are. And the idea here is to use the type checker to design out a lot of potential faults uh, that might creep into your code. So that's nice for Java because it fits well with the sort of Java way of doing things. It's what Java people would expect. So when I wrote Python CSP and designed that, I made all the channels any to any channel. And I didn't give people a read end and a write end. I let them shoot themselves in the foot because it seems to me to be a bit more of a sort of dynamic way of doing things and a bit more Pythonic, but not faultless, not foolproof. So those are, those are a couple of different design choices. Another is mobile or immobile channels. So this is something that wasn't built into CSP originally, um, but it was built into a different process algebra called, uh, called the Pi Calculus by Robin Milner. And then the Kent, uh, the team at Kent University who sort of took over uh, the development of Occam created Occam Pi, which sort of fused together the Pi calculus and the uh, CSP way of doing things. So a mobile channel is a channel that can be sent down another channel to a different process. And the idea of doing that is that you can think of your message passing program as being like a graph where the nodes of the graph are your processes and the arcs between processes are your channels that link those processes together. At runtime, you may wish to change the topology of that graph and change its shape. So two good reasons why you might do this. One might be a bit to do with load balancing. If you have a computation that's split among a lot of processes, you might find some of them are more active than others, and you might decide to change the load balance between them, which might also mean changing the topology of the graph and who's reporting their data back to who and who's aggregating the data and so forth. That's one reason. Another reason might be that uh, you might be running these processes across a network. So you might not only be working with one machine, you might have some processes farmed out to another machine on your network, and then you might have issues like uh, latency, or you might have issues like network failure, or whatever, and that might make you think, well, during the running of my process, my, uh, my computation, I'd like to change the topology to make the most efficient use of that network of machines. So that's one reason. So this, this, is, this leads to sort of two issues. Mobile channels can be great if you can, if you can use them really well and you've got a good use case for them. If you're in a situation where you, you need to shut down this network and graph of running concurrent processes, then you need to notify each node in, in your graph uh, that it needs to shut down. And so doing that safely is quite an important thing to do. So in the sort of message passing world, one way to do this is called poisoning, which means that you tell a channel, or the node that decides to shut everything down or shut a few things down, tells 
a channel or all of its channels that it knows about that they need to start shutting down and they need to propagate the message that this program is going to halt. And this is called poisoning. So you poison a channel and the idea is that it poisons the well of the whole program and each process shuts itself down safely. And that's something that takes a little bit of care and a little bit of good engineering because you need to think, well, you know, if I'm a process and you're all processes and I say I want you to all die and then I'm going to die, <laughs> you know, then that, that needs to happen in the right order. If I kill myself first, you won't know what to do. <laughs> or not who knows okay so the other the other we talked about channels we talked about mobility different sorts of channels the other thing is how to represent the processes and there are a lot of different choices there too so in some languages uh, one CSP process is one co-routine um, and that makes sense in some paradigms, so I think this is kind of how uh, Node.js works. And that leads to very fast message passing, because in the runtime system, all those processes share memory. They're all really in the same operating system thread, so they can do a lot of things very, very fast, and they can pass messages down channels very, very fast. But then it's hard to take advantage of multicore if you're all in one thread. Um, you could have a one-to-one -one mapping where one CSP process is one OS thread. That gives you much slower message passing because whoever implements that does have to deal with locking and all those low-level issues. But then you can start taking advantage of the features that your operating system has. You could make one CSP process one OS process. And that's a really good choice if you're thinking about migrating processes around a network and running your code on more than one computer at once. So sort of MPI style, if you're into MPI. Or you can have some sort of uh, multiplexed version of all of those options. So you can have some process, CSP processes that are co-routines but live inside an OS thread and there are other CSP processes that live inside another OS thread but are really co-routines themselves and all sorts of combinations therein. And this is really where uh, why Python CSP was not as fast as we'd hoped because we were looking at taking advantage of multi-core in the network so we were using these sorts of one-to-one -one mappings which are not the best. Uh, in terms of speed. So I'm not going to talk for a huge amount longer because uh, hopefully um, we can have a, a good discussion. But I wanted to say a little bit about message passing in Python. So there are lots of, although we don't have, although Python is not a message passing language in the way that Go is and Rust is and um, all those other things. Python does sort of have a lot of these ideas built into its ecosystem. And sometimes in libraries, sometimes in different implementations of the interpreter, sometimes in all sorts of other ways. So I was really pleased looking through the EuroPython schedule to find that actually there are a lot of different talks in this conference that in some way have quite a lot to do with the ideas that I've been talking about today. So not necessarily straightforward implementations of message passing in the way that Python CSP was, but they take on some of those ideas either by implementing coroutines or using coroutines or using channels um, and so on. So in a sense, message passing for Python is already here, in a sense. Um, and also, of course, in Python 3.4, we have coroutines built in. So there's perhaps a big opportunity there to think about building these things in uh, uh, to the core of the language. So if you're interested in this stuff, then I'd certainly be interested in talking to you. Um, my next steps for this, Python CSP has been sort of in abeyance for the last three, few years while my... Uh, day job has um, taken me to do different things. But Python for the Parallela 
uh, board will be coming out this summer. So I've got a project working on that this summer, starting sort of mid-August, and we'll be looking at nice and hopefully efficient ways of using Python for the parallela that ideally would use message passing in some way, but we'll see how that works out. The jury's rather out in, on that one. And Python CSP is certainly moving back into regular development. Sam's language now lang, uh, will be continuing, so I'll be at the PyPy Sprint this Saturday doing a little bit more on that. And if you are interested in this stuff, then please do come and catch me sometime. Thank you very much. If you have questions, can you please sign up on the mics on the other side of the hall? Uh, hello. Um, I have seen that uh, we are always uh, relying on the <laughs> operative system layer for uh, the threads or the core routines, etc. Uh, has been any um, enhancement on how uh, processors can pass from one to another information about uh, besides the uh, caches and all those things? Um, yeah, so that there's, there was an interesting development in the OpenMPI library a few years ago when they found that their message passing was a little bit slower than they would like and Open MPI people tend to work on Linux. So the Linux kernel brought in a new way of doing that, which is called cross-memory attach. And the idea of cross-memory attach, and I think it is only a Linux thing now, but the idea of it is that you've got two different operating system processes. And then rather than saying, rather than doing what you would do in a pipe, which is that you copy the memory, you have you keep the memory in one place and then you pass around um, a sort of handle to that memory between processes. So that's a much quicker way of doing it that was built specifically for MPI, but would possibly be a really good way forward for, for any other implementation, like an implementation on Python. So yeah, there's definitely some interesting work there. Hello, uh, I wanted to ask what the Python CSP library provides that a Sage event doesn't apart from the simpler API? Um, well, it's a good question. It's a different API. I, I don't know if it's simpler or not. Um, Python CSP sort of started because I wanted, a lang a, a port I wanted something like this in Python, but the only things that were available were direct ports of the Java JCSP language. So the idea of this is that it's really, it's much more similar to a CSP way of doing things um, than anything else. So what does it provide? It provides processes which can be, ooh, which can be various sorts of processes. Um, it provides channels, it provides selection or alternation. Um, it provides a small library of built-in processes that might be useful. So the, the reason for that is that the way that CSP people tend to think about this is that the more concurrency you have, the better. So rather than saying, well, I've got my nice sequential program, how do I split it up to make it efficient or concurrent or sensible or, or whatever it is, they say, well, you know, make everything you possibly can concurrent. So they tend to have libraries of, of processes that do things like have two channels, read down those two, read two numbers from those channels, add them together, and send them out down a third channel. So a process that just does addition, and then a process that just does all the other arithmetic things. So there's support for that way of working, if that way of working is something that's interesting to you. Um, 
I suspect, though, that that way of working is probably only interesting to people who are interested in CSP for its own sake, because it's not a terribly pragmatic way of working. So, I mean, the answer to your question really is that Python CSP implements all the sort of basic things that you expect of a message passing library. It's just a matter of how it implements them and how well. And I think we probably score about five out of ten for that at the moment, but hopefully it'll get better. So, quick question on Python CSP and multiple processes. Is it currently implemented with multi... Is, does it use something like multiple processing, uh, multi-processing? How, how are you doing the, the message passing across processes? Is it um, using Pickle to serialize them? So, so the, we've got two different ways of doing it. One, one with threads and one with processes. But I didn't use multi-processing. I just use OS.fork and that sort of okay. thing. So, Windows is out of the question. Yeah, so the idea of that was that multiprocessing is really built for a particular way of working and it has a lot of internal code um, that supports that way of working but isn't so useful if you want to do things the CSP way. So, for example, I think when you, when you spawn a process in multiprocessing, that process also spawns a watchdog thread for that process. But... In a CSP library, you don't need that. So the idea was to be just a little tiny bit more efficient by not having those multiprocessing internals. Um, I think in reality, that if you compared a version of Python CSP using multiprocessing on one without, you probably wouldn't find a vast amount of difference. So you could easily do most of these things using multiprocessing because you've got pipes in, in the MP library. Um, so in that sense, Python has some of these things built in already. And so you use the, the OS fork memory copying to, um, to do yep. the message passing? No, to do the processes. Oh, to do the and processes. then and, uh, pickle and... Okay, so uh, you use... Okay, so I think I might know why your message passing is the bottleneck. <laughs> yes, I, I think that's a very good... Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, something like, so shared memory is a problem for object passing um, because you still have the question of then who owns the reference count. Um, so some kind of library that could, where you could have immutable data structures um, where, and you, you have a convention that the, that the receiving channel owns the message that's been passed, so it's responsible for the, um, the destruction. Uh, and then you, can, then you could do um, reliable message passing between between channels. Yeah, I, th I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, so, so I, the, the version of Python CSP that uses OS processes uses sort of Unix shared memory type things, and that's still quite slow, partly because I think shared memory is more efficient when you're copying a large amount of data or copying data many times through the shared memory. It's not really intended for sort of one-off um, sends and receives which is, is kind of what you're doing when right, you do so. a message pass in CSP. So it's not really the right, the right tool for the job, whereas something like cross-memory attach might be. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so where do you see the future of message passing in Python? Would it be something like PyPySTM or rather something like async IO or... So, so async IO um, sort of does this kind of thing already, but for IO processes that you want to run in the background and for that particular use case, which is, which is great. Um, but for more general computation, I think it would be interesting to see message passing used together with Python 3.4 coroutines and see how that goes. I think that would be a really interesting experiment to do and really interesting to, to benchmark that and see if it could get really fast and usable for, for the sort of, you know, the, the sort of, as it were, the ordinary programmer rather than someone who's got a particular use case like, uh, like background I.O. So in the PyPy STM, like, would that be any, any hope? So, so PyPySTM is a, is a fantastic piece of work. Um, 
As I understand it, the purpose of PyPy STM is to make the core interpreter um, concurrent in a sense, which means that you can then build these high-level sorts of concurrency that the programmer would see on top of that. So I wouldn't expect, I would expect that, I hope PyPy STM is really successful. I wouldn't expect that that would mean that ordinary PyPy programmers, ordinary Python programmers rather, use STM in their own applications. I think that's kind of the wrong level of abstraction for the, for the programmer. So I think building message passing on top of PyPy STM would be, would be really interesting. I have other question. Um, you already mentioned Stackless Python. Uh, did you look into the uh, coroutines uh, in Stackless Python? They are called tasklets and the channels provided by Stackless Python. So I didn't quite catch that. Uh, sorry, um, Stackless Python is a, an alternative implementation of the, stack, of the Python interpreter. And it pro already provides uh, coroutines and channels and message passing over these channels. And did you look into it? Yeah, yeah. So, so I think my understanding is that Stackless has a different implementation of the Python interpreter. So it's it's not quite C Python, uh, which is why it's Stackless. Well, ac actually, <laughs> ac actually, it is C Python with some additions. With some, yeah. Okay, with some changes. So, yeah. So yeah. it's uh, fully binary compatible with C Python. Yeah. So yeah, so I did. So yeah, that that's also a really interesting piece of work. Um, yeah. Okay. We do have a time for one last question. Do we have anyone?